Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was, of course, breaking news that there was a coup in Mali. And that, of course, was followed by yet another coup that took place, uh, of course, uh, led by uh, Colonel Asimi Goita. Uh, since then, the Economic Community of West African States, led by, of course, its leaders and uh, uh, former presidents and the likes across uh, Africa, had stepped in to try and negotiate uh, for a peaceful resolution of the situation in Mali and also asking, you know, for a time frame before they can go back to democratic rule. But that it hasn't gone very well. It, um, in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours, there have been more sanctions placed on Mali. Uh, we're speaking this morning with Dr. Kach Ononuju, who is a director general at the Heritage Center. Uh, good morning and thanks for joining us, Dr. Ononuju. Thank you very much for having me. Good to see you again. Uh, let's begin by clarifying or going, you know, to understand exactly what the situation is in Mali. Where is there some confusion between ECOWAS and Colonel Asimi Goita and, of course, the rem remaining of the coup leaders? Well, I will want to say that ECOWAS seems to be waking up very late. Uh, this crisis started uh, long before now. And then in 2015, there was a peace agreement. I remember I was in Bamako myself. And uh, I advised some of the leaders, including when I came back here, speaking to our president and my former boss, President Goodluck, who later was appointed as a ministry. And I opined that the best way to have this issue resolved was to make sure that the other West African leaders are carried along for an implementation of the 2015 peace agreement. It was when some of the leaders, including our president, President Buhari, did not actually do those things and they thought they could do it on their own that you saw the bottlenecks that we've seen. So it is as a consequence of non-implementation of that 2015 peace agreement that you've seen the various schools have come primarily the crisis you see in nigeria is an overflow of the problem you see in mali why do i say that in central mali there was a war between the dogons and the fulanis and why we say resolve the Malian crisis because it's like a dam. If you don't resolve that crisis, when the dam busts, it will affect the entire subregion. And that was why you saw refugees flooded into Nigeria. Today in Nigeria, we have IDP camps where indigenous people are staying in IDP camps, but their ancestral lands are being occupied by refugees from Mali. And because we weren't able to treat this thing the way it should be, that's why it has come to affect us today. Now, President Buhari is about to leave office. And of course, as you know about land, wherever these refugees occupy land, indigenous people will, of course, go back to their land when the time gets clear. And that seems to be when Buhari is no more in power in Nigeria. That is inevitable. So if they have, taking the seriousness could they think they can now bring now, all along, I'm sure we may have had a good go-ahead in Mali. Because why? It's one thing to negotiate it's the most difficult part is in implementation of that disagreement. We saw it all in Northern Ireland with the IRA and the Ulster Unionist Party and the United Kingdom government. Now we are seeing it again in the issue of Mali and its spillover that has brought so much of Fulani and refugees into Nigeria, so much so that it has forced displacements of indigenous people in ancestral lands across northern Nigeria, and of course, it is not resolved. And now the leaders think they can give it another go. I repeat what I said earlier, years ago, the right way to solve the Malian price crisis is to get the entire West African leaders on the table to forcefully implement the 2015 peace agreement that can get refugees back to their places 
if you try to put pressure on the Malian government, what you have is coup and counter coups and counter coups and counter coups as we now seem to have. Okay, um, Dr. Kach Onunudru, uh, do you think that the non implementation of the peace agreement, like you have mentioned, is a justification for um, you know, the military junta to want to stay in power for the next four years rather than have an election conducted uh, you know, in next month? Is that enough you know, uh, no, justification? No, no. That, I, I'm no, just asking no, that you show you. Yes, I'm also asking if that, because I mean, in less than nine months, there's been two coups already, and, and that doesn't really tell well you know, for the West African region. Uh, so I'd like to share your thoughts on that. Yes, it is not any reason for the military junta to do the coup, because the military junta are doing coup actually forecloses any progress in regards to implementation of that 2015 peace agreement, because the junta's have their reasons for calling. The other junta do the coup when there was strong pressure from Nigeria and President Goodlo Jonathan was going there and going there and going there again. And because of the pressures some people felt was coming from Nigeria, they did that coup to forestall what they thought the civilian administration would have done if they still were in place. So what I still say, it has to be a region-wide thing. Everybody must come together. Don't leave it for the Malians alone. No. Because as I said earlier, it's like a dam. When the dam breaks, the flood affects everybody in the sub-region. As you've seen, it affects everybody in the sub-region. Right. They Dr. should take it seriously and leave yeah. it not live as the Malian crisis. No, they shouldn't. All right, Dr. Nonjuju, uh, let's now look into the sanctions that have been placed. Give us some clarity as to um, what ECOWAS is trying to achieve and what exactly these sanctions are like. Uh, Dr. Um, Colonel uh, Simi Goita has said that it is, uh, these sanctions are unfair and they do not you know, represent what ECOWAS even stands for. Uh, so give us some clarity on that. Well, the sanctions are coming late. The sanctions could have been should have been here yesterday. The should have been here. The military coup was a strategy to undermine implementation of the peace agreement. That's when the sanctions should have come. Right when the coup the coupies came in, you've allowed them to sit down and they started enjoying the things that come with office. And suddenly, what would you want to say to them? They, just like all the West African leaders, will want to stay put. We want to give you dates. We want to deceive the population. I don't see any implementation of the peace agreement as far as those soldiers that did the coup are there. So what I think, we should double up on the functions. We should put more pressure on them. We should have started this pressure right from the very first week when the soldiers came in because the essence of them coming in was to block the sustained progress of the implementation of the peace agreement. We have to get the soldiers out, put a civilian government in place, and then get those people to carry out the peace agreement. Without that peace agreement, you will continue to have this uh, instability within the West African sub-region, as you have seen it affect Nigeria, affect other countries. There were even countries where the people were told, if you ever see a, a Malian with his cattle on the street, as it was in Ghana, slaughter the cattle. Don't let them, don't accommodate them. But we accommodated them in Nigeria, except the way we did it. We didn't do it honestly. We were pretending we were doing agricultural programs. They are not. And today, we have IDPs in Nigeria displaced for those foreigners to stay in our villages. And I don't see any end to that. That's part of the reason why, if you ask me, I will tell you, the Buhari administration is afraid that should we leave, such legacies will, of course, be upturned by whoever well, comes after him. Doctor, and that's why I believe, doctor, in the first place, refugees should be kept at home. Doctor, you're talking about you know, tightening and, you know, even more sanctions, you know, to put pressure on the yes. coup plotters. But look at the yes. reaction from the coup plotters now. They've currently closed all borders with ECOWAS uh, member states and neighboring countries. 
Um, they don't seem to be bothered by these sanctions. It, it doesn't seem like any of it is going to move um, any of them. And so very likely it's the citizens, it's the, it's the, it's the Malians that will suffer. Um, so well, how, how long are we going to play these games? If ECOWAS is placing sanctions, Mali, uh, on the other hand, is reacting to the sanctions, or the coup plotters are reacting to sanctions and, and shutting their borders with these countries, how much longer will this last? And what will eventually, you know, at least make a, a, dif a difference? Thank you very much for this angle. This tells you that the sanctions are coming late. If the sanctions had come much, much earlier, they will have known that there is no, no part to the road that they are taking. It doesn't lead them anywhere. Yes, they could do this as a way to show that they could do a tit for tat. You can't do a tit for tat with the subreacher. Once you're closed all around, you will go nowhere. That's why once the ECOWAS people are united in their mindset about Mali, and Mali is totally cordoned off, it's only a matter of time before people inside will tell the soldiers, you cannot win this way. You have to open up to the sub -region. You have to open up to ECOWAS. Don't forget, no man is an island. Nobody can live alone. So what you're not seeing them do, it's nothing. We should not stop. We should put more sanctions. And we should get the international community to understand what we're doing. These soldiers are not agreeing to an implementation of the peace agreement. And if they are, to sustain and succeed in that, that would be a very big problem for the sub region because whatever ails Mali affects the sub region. Whatever affects Mali affects the rest of us. We should have done this earlier than now. We okay. should not in any way step down. Put more sanctions, they will come to the table. That's how it works. Okay, um, Dr. Kaj from Nunujuru, uh, let's talk about the trickle-down effect now. You have mentioned that, first of all, Nigeria is bearing the brunt already. Uh, will there be a trickle-down effect to other, you know, um, countries in the West African region? I'm talking about what is currently going on right now in Mali and the effect it will yes. have. So, so, so what are, what are yes. these effects that, you know, other countries in this region are expected to experience? Well, as you can see from the Nigerian experience, the Bororo Fulanese that came in from Mali are unknown to our shores. They brought their guns there, and that was why Governor Ganduje was saying, let them in, but don't let them in with their guns. Those guns they were bringing from the war front in Mali, and they were bringing them into Nigeria. So you are complaining about Nigeria. It must also have affected other countries that are much smaller than Nigeria is. You let them carry the guns into the bushes. Before you know it, they, the gun becomes an aphrodisiac that now prompts them to do anything. Today, I was surprised. I was speaking to car dealer last week, and I said, uh, these cars, I like them. Uh, what are the colors? He said, oh, guy, are you asking about colors? I said, what do you mean? Are you a Malian? I said, what do you mean? He says, it's only Malians that will talk about colors when they buy cars, because why? They will buy several colors of the same car. They're telling you that when these Malian kidnappers get money from kidnapping in Nigeria, as I'm sure they also do in other countries, they will buy cars, buy several colors, take them to Bamako. Once the money comes back, they will come back to Nigeria and start their crisis. And that's why you see someone like Governor Erufai got very angry. Because no matter what you agree with those Malians, once the money they have is finished, they will go back again to the crimes. That's why you saw the way they were attacking people in Nigeria. They don't know who is who. They don't know the difference between the Hausa and the Fulani. They just attack anybody that they saw. For the first time in our lifetime, we saw Fulani killing Hausa in Basari, in Sapana, in Dutchima, in Kankara, in Emusa, in places like Maru, in Anka. In Tangobe, in Densado, look at Benue State. They have several IDPs. Same thing with Plaki. As I last night I was told, it has increased from 77 to 125 villages in Plaki State. Now under IDP camp, while foreign refugees occupy their villages. Now this is going to be a problem for whoever is going to come after President Buhari because indigenous people come and complain, give us of our land, receive us back in our lands. You cannot have Galibashi who tell them they don't have permission 
before going back to their lands. They will find a way to go back to their lands. And that becomes a problem for the refugees that President Buhari has tried to quarter in Nigeria. So this is this problem. I'm talking about Nigeria. What about the trickle-down effect in other nations that also have different ways of trying to react to this kind of security challenges? It is a problem. It's a West African problem and should be collectively dealt by all leaders in West Africa because whatever else Mali will affect the rest of us. As I said earlier, it's like a dam. When the dam bursts, the overflow from that dam busting will affect everybody within the vicinity of the dam. So whenever the dam in Mali busts, it's affecting everybody in the West African sub-region. Mm -hmm. And that, I believe, we must take very, very seriously and put more sanctions on them. Sanctions do work, but they take time to work. That's why I said you shouldn't have said it now. You should have said it way before, day before yesterday, right when the soldiers came in. Give them sanctions because we understand why they came in. They came in to stop the implementation of the peace agreement. Okay. Um, Dr. Onondijo, I'm not sure if we still have you. All right, uh, we may have lost him uh, briefly there, but of course we will reconnect with uh, Dr. Kach Onnonuju, who is of course the Director General at the Heritage Center. Okay, welcome back. Dr. Onnonuju, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very okay, clearly. Welcome back. Sorry, we had lost you briefly there. Um, you, you keep talking about the 2015 peace agreement. Um, can, can we get some clarity on what exactly that is, uh, as quickly as possible, before I ask the next question? Well, the peace agreement, because there was this war that started much, much earlier than 2015. But in 2015, there was a peace agreement agreed to resettle both the Fulanese who were escaping from the central Mali where they were fighting with the dogmans to for them not to come back to where they used to live as their homes. But when that wasn't done, President Buhari came in and instead of him pursuing that peace agreement vigorously, he now thought he could resettle oh. those Malian refugees in Nigeria. That was why he started applying for grazing reserves. They weren't anything to do with agriculture. He wanted to resettle those refugees. Nigerians oh. refused. He asked for car colony. We refused. He talked about a consolidation of underground and surface water plus six kilometers of land impacting those waters. Nigeria refused. He now tried to talk about grazing reserve. Nigeria refused. Then the Fulani militia men started killing as a way to ethnically cleanse indigenous people off land to take that land. And that was why the resettlement occurred. And as I'm talking to you right now, we have IDP camps all over the north. Oh, wow. Even though we're not at the, war, these are, it's as a consequence of that action. This, this is, you know, a completely, you know, shocking um, analysis, you know, with regards to the, you know, banditry, as it has been called in Nigeria, and the insurgency that we've been, we've been dealing with. Um, you know, a lot of people wouldn't understand it from this angle, but from what you're saying... You that know, is the root of it. That is the root of it. Don't ever... Nothing about the banditry had to do with agriculture. It's all about land. When we didn't give land to the president, as he sought them, that was why the militia men started looking for land violently. And that's why, as I'm talking to you, we have IDP camps all over the north, even though we're not yet at war. That's why that problem occurred. Okay. So, so but do you think that, you know, the, the leaders of uh, this region have actually done enough and ECO as, as a governing body has done enough, you know, in addressing and ensuring that we do not have a repeat of coup d'etat and unconstitutional seizure of power in Africa? No, they've not done enough because they kept much at the time of the coup. I advise privately that the sanctions should come in. Don't give them chance. It's when you relax that other coup plotters will also think they can do a counter coup. Show them that coups are not allowed in a democratic setting. But that apart, apart from the Dr. Dr. Kaj, apart from the, uh, you know, having these sanctions, are there other means that, you know, these leaders would have intervened without having to, I mean, we getting, because we've gotten to the point where we have to use sanctions now. So prior to well, this time, uh, should there have been other approach that would have been applied to quell down all of this? Yes. Yes, we have previously, we have before in West Africa used the military of other West African states, most especially Nigeria, to intervene in countries like that to bring peace. Because that would have been the best thing to do. Because 
those doing that coup right now are a faction of the ethnic argumentators and protagonists in that war. If Ekomok had gone in and secured man, they would have been able to bring back refugees to resettle back on their land. You see, why you did not do that? The refugees kept running away, and then that put pressure on countries in the sub-region, like Nigeria. You can see how much we Nigerians suffered. So it's not as if uh, this thing is a rocket science. No. If you don't do that, what you should do, as at the time when you should do it, you will suffer the consequences as we have suffered right now. We didn't do it well. We also weren't sincere, pretending as if we had an agricultural problem we wanted to solve in Nigeria, whereas it was a refugee crisis. And today what we have, you displace Nigerians internally, and you have foreigners in their villages. Of course, it's not going to work because we're not at war. So at last, the army has begged to be allowed to deal with these people because these people are terrorists. They are terrorizing Nigerians, killing Nigerians everywhere. And we should never have tolerated that as President Buhari was willing to tolerate it. Well, uh, final question from me, um, you know, is uh, because, you know, the angle that you've brought in now is a whole interview's worth. You know, it cannot be talked about, you know, just briefly. Because uh, I know there's people who would argue that most of the people who are committing these crimes in, Niger in uh, northern Nigeria are Nigerians and not from you know outside. They're not Malians or anything. But that's it's, it's a total different. Hold on, hold on. You don't know this. I will teach you, please. I have been on this issue for this problem. I've been to Mali for this crisis. I've been to Gambia for this crisis. I've been to Senegal. So I know this issue. I was dealing with this issue under President Gulo when yeah. President Buhari came in. Peace agreement was reached. Where I advised him, him do this, get other leaders to implement it. No, he thought he could resettle the refugees here. Me and you now know why it's been wow. since looking for land, looking for land, looking for land, and he couldn't get it. Now that he's about to leave office, what will be the fate of those refugees? If the indigenous people who have lost their central land are today in IDP camp, what that tells you is that the West African leaders we'll have to find a way to resolve this problem. Well, no let, problem let's, let's talk about, there. Dr. Onanuju, I, I want us to close with talking about the international community. Mali is Africa's third largest producer of gold. Um, there's obviously going to be some, maybe, not, not, not obviously, some influence from the French-speaking community, from Germany and the likes. Uh, do you think that they would have any influence here? Yes, the French have been here. The French were actually the first to move in with a peacekeeping operation. I met the French there when I went to Mali, and uh, I went to myself to Mpotsi, central Mali, where this issue was occurring. I came back to Nigeria, and I shared my experiences with Nigerians on channels television. So I believe that the input of French, the French, are very, very important. Because as you rightly stated, there are minerals there, and there are international uh, organizations and companies that are there mining these minerals. And of course, they wouldn't be involved in such uh, an economically lucrative activity without some support from their home government. So whatever you do in that space, those people will care how you operate, and their home government will also be there to caution you so that you do not do things that undermine the economic activity that their home companies are engaging in Mali. So Mali cannot be resolved by one person. It can be done by Nigeria alone. So when you saw Nigeria try to travel, travel, travel with good luck and try to bring some kind of uh, 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 influence, the coup happened. We yeah. need the contribution of everybody in the sub-region to solve it because Malian crisis is an ECOWAS crisis. No one single person should try to do it alone. It is that serious. You can see how it has affected us in Nigeria from my explanation. So it also would have affected other countries in the sub-region from what you've seen just in Nigeria. All right. Please, we should come together to resolve Malian crisis. All right. Uh, Dr. Kachan Onanju, thank you so much for... Uh, this conversation. I truly um, enjoyed it. And of course, thanks for the different angles that you've also thrown into the discussion. Uh, we wish you a great day ahead and looking forward to speaking with you again, as always.
Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And uh, away from Mali, we're back here in Lagos, <laughs> and this is where we will be saying goodbye this morning. But of course, if you want to follow up or catch up on any of those conversations, pretty simple on our social media platforms. On Facebook, we're at Plus TV Africa, and Instagram, do subscribe to YouTube channels at Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. And I am Messi Bobo. Do have a great day ahead. And I am Osaogi Ogbawan.